not supposed to be dividing up Judaism into these different sects. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to notice these different names. Now, the devil actually has tried to bring about different systems altogether. He has individuals that have come along and said, I want to teach the Baptist doctrine. I want to teach Pentecostal holiness. I want to teach apostolic, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist. Now, friends, these are not branches of Christianity. They are not in the system of Christianity at all. They are like the Stoics, the Epicureans. They are individuals who are actually outside of the system trying to either mimic the system or uh, say that they are part of it. John 17, 17 says very, very clearly, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. The way that we're set apart, the word sanctification means to set apart. Jesus intended for his individuals, for the persons who are in his church, in his body, in the spiritual uh, kingdom, in the spiritual temple of which members are stones, in the vine which members are branches, in the flock which members are sheep, they were to be set aside unto God as a result of responding to the truth. Well, what is the truth? Thy word is the truth. You cannot be set aside to Jesus by hearing a form that is not the truth or a gospel that does not, that actually isn't according to the gospel. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 through 8 that it's not the gospel, it's another gospel. And see, another gospel does not sanctify you. And so friends, tonight, what we've been trying to present to you throughout the last seven or eight years is that there is a form of truth. It is that which will sanctify you, set you apart in the service of God, and all of this other is simply strange to God. It is not a part. It is not in the system. It's not a division of the system. It is actually something that is totally different. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, Who shall be punished with everlasting instruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power? If you stay outside of the Lord's church, of the Lord's kingdom, of the Lord's body, of the Lord's temple, of the Lord's flock, you will end up being that way for eternity. You see, in obeying the gospel or in obeying the truth, you actually are set apart unto the service of God. You're translated, Colossians 1.13, into the kingdom of God out from the power of darkness. If you stay outside then you are actually going to be there forever. That's what the scripture is saying. In Revelation 28 verse 9, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerer, the idolater, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Individuals who are giving you out information, giving you information that is not this, is not the truth, that contains all of these different forms and calling it Christianity, they are basically following a lie, and they are not setting you apart for the service of the Lord. You see, the Lord is not served by individuals who are teaching strange doctrines, diverse and strange doctrines that are not according to the truth. They're not setting you apart in the service of the Lord. They're having you serve Satan. That's basically what we're saying. Now, friends, I know that's a hard and a very difficult thing for you to hear. But the question is, where did you hear that it was satisfying to the Lord? That's what you need to ask yourself. If you want to call in and argue with me tonight, the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to present information where you got that God is going to be satisfied with something beside the truth. All of this out here in religion that is not actually according to this word is not going to set you aside, set you apart for service unto the Lord. You cannot be sanctified, set apart unto the Lord by hearing and obeying a strange form of doctrine. What it actually makes you is it makes you a person who is not at all in the system of Christianity. Now, let's talk about uh, what the Bible says in regard to how God feels about that. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all may be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Many of you are actually deluded and you're actually uh, have been tricked into thinking that you're pleasing unto God, that inside of these particular uh, systems, these particular religions out there, trying to bind yourself back to God uh, through these particular man-made religions, you think that you are actually pleasing to God. Persons have tricked you into thinking that you're just as satisfactory to God as if you had actually followed the truth. But you see, you've believed a lie. 
Whoever told you that you can be a Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, or a Pentecostal, a Church of God in Christ, any of those particular man-made religions, you have believed a lie. Now, if you say, well, I didn't believe a lie, then what you need to do is show it in the truth. And you can't do that, so the only thing persons will do is get upset with me. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to begin to demonstrate what the truth is. We're going to start showing you what the system of truth really is, the one faith, what it contains. Now, I want you to basically listen tonight to a call that prompted this. I, want, I think this, this caller actually has, has uh, presented information that's going to be very helpful to us tonight in the sense of making it clear what we are saying and what we're not saying. Let's take a listen. You know, what's the Bible say? Johnny. Yes. Uh, the lady just called and she came out of uh, this man's church or yeah. his religion or what? Yeah. She said she actually came out of this church right here, the uh, uh, Calvary Hill, let's see what I did, right here, Calvary Hill uh, Pentecostal Church. I can't Let's show you the pastor here. Benny, yeah, I was here last year at the Church of Christ. We wanted to come by and ask him if he'd like to come to our tent meeting tonight and see if he would. There he is. Remember me last year? Yeah. Grant Stubblefield from the Church of Christ. That's the pastor over in the United Pentecostal Church International over in Martinsville that she came out of. So there was a division there, right? No. She just actually got to the point where she did not want to be intimidated anymore, pushed and, and coerced and told that she was an unbeliever because she wouldn't get out on the floor and wall around with the, the rest of them, and she left. Okay, so if we belong to the Methodists or the Baptists or the Holiness, and you belong to the Church of Christ? I actually belong to Christ. Yeah, but the church that you are representing... The only church that's in the Bible, you says what? It's the Church of Christ, that's right, or the Church of God, depending on which scripture you're reading from. And if we are... Good evening, everybody. This is What Does the Bible Say? My name is Caleb Robertson. I am a Christian, and I do evangelistic work with the body of Christ. And tonight, this broadcast is live. This is a live religious call-in broadcast where we just go through this called What Does the Bible Say? So it's pretty self-explanatory. But we go through and we discuss, really, the topics that divide us. And a lot of times, people, when you start doing something like that, and really what it comes down to is, you're going to watch this broadcast if you become a regular viewer, and one week we might be talking about what Pentecostals teach, that's incorrect. Next week we might be talking about what Southern Baptists teach, that's incorrect. You'll find us talking about Episcopalians and what they teach and what's incorrect. And a lot of people will say, well, why do you want to start trouble and why do you want to start causing all this division? Look, the division, you think I started, I'm 28, you think I started the division of Episcopalianism? That's King Henry VIII. He started the sect that's called the Church of England. So what we're doing, though, as we go through and we have these controversial discussions, anybody will tell you that the number one step of conflict re resolution is stating that there is at least a problem. In the religious community, we have a very big problem, and it's division. It's just not enough for all these people to say, you know, they put their hand on the say, well, I believe the Bible. They don't read it. They don't know what the Bible teaches. They only know what their pastor spoon-feeds them and has been spoon-feeding them for the past however many years. But they themselves don't know the Bible, and therefore they don't know that they're actually being duped by these sectarian pastors. So let's do this really quickly as we get going. Do you have your Bible out tonight? We are going to be talking about... These are so simple discussions, too, but people are really, really messed up on it. So have your Bible out. We're going to have a Bible program up behind us, and, you know, like we say, we'll put the phone lines up at some point. This is what we want to say as we get going, okay? You've been watching What Does the Bible Say? You might be watching on WIG TV out in the Wilson, Tarboro, Greenville, North Carolina area. You're out there. You're watching What Does the Bible Say Now? You might be on the other side of North Carolina and watching through Star News. And you say, I like what does the Bible say? I like what they're trying to do, the message of unity inside the religious community. You like that. You say, but my cousin Ted doesn't live in North Carolina. He lives in Wisconsin. Ted can watch it on YouTube, and this is what it will look like. You tell Ted, Google YouTube Johnny Robertson. That's my dad. That's his picture. That's what the YouTube channel will look like, purple, white banner. There's the Watch Live icon where they can join in live right now wherever they are that has access to YouTube. And then as we do this, that's what it will look like on their smartphone or their computer or what have you. And this is what we want to do. 
This is why we want to talk to everybody everywhere. It's not enough on a Sunday morning to go in and sit on a hard pew for one hour. We want to get past this idea of American traditional sectarianism where you get your ticket punched, you eat your cracker, you drink your juice, and you go home, and you're really not living the Christian life. We want to end religious division based on having unity, based on conformity to the New Testament text. When I started this broadcast, I said I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian only. I'm not Southern Baptist. I'm not a Roman Papist. I'm not Methodist. I'm not Jehovah Witness, and I'm not a Mormon. Any sectarian group started by a man outside of the first century, I am not associated with them. And then, actually, last week we got a phone call from the Wilson, North Carolina area, and the man said, what assembly are you with? I am a Christian. I'm a member of the body of Christ, the one church you read about in your New Testament. But if you're asking me like a, an earthly headquarters, I'm not in a sect. I'm in the one body because I'm following the Bible by itself. If you just read your New Testament and you don't use manuals and you don't use creed books, we could simplify New Testament religion, New Testament Christianity, and we could have more unity. Now, one more thing, simple plea. We want religious unity. Do you know this is in your Bible? Let's just start out with a very simple verse. You say, no, I didn't know that was in there. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This is what we're shooting for. No more of this business where someone says, well, I was saved this way, I was saved that way, and Ted, he was saved a third way. No. In the New Testament, what it teaches us is that everybody should be saved according to the same idea of obeying the gospel. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. That's Romans chapter 10, verse number 16. And I believe it's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 17. You can check me on that last one. So, one more. This is my personal contact info. If we miss your phone call tonight on the broadcast, this phone line will go off after 10 o'clock. But if you want to get me tomorrow or whenever, that's my personal number, 276-806-3641. And my email address is calebgrobertson at gmail.com. And if you email me, we'll put you on the informer list. It's a free page and a half Bible article that we send out every Sunday morning. This morning, we're talking about how Christians ought to treat their enemies if they have them. And if you are a Christian, you're going to have some. So let's do this. This is what we're doing tonight, okay? This is different than what I did on Thursday night, okay? If you've been looking at anything on the internet, if you know, if you don't live underneath a rock, let's say it that way, surely by now you have heard that Creflo Dollar is changing his idea on tithing. And I say good for Creflo Dollar, and now I'm asking you, if Creflo Dollar can be making some adjustments to his teaching, do you think that you, your pastor, your Sunday school teacher, whoever, could they make some corrections to their teaching? Now, I would give you this room, okay? You might say, well, maybe you don't recognize that what your pastor is teaching is incorrect. If you're in a man-made sect, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Lutheran. You watch this broadcast long enough, you're going to hear us talk about your man-made sect and your traditional sectarian doctrines. You're going to learn pretty quick what y'all are teaching that's incorrect. And tonight, I'm going to do that with Creflo Dollar. Do I agree with what he's saying about tithing? I do. Tithing is not a New Testament command. What do you have in your New Testament? You have Christians who freely gave on the first day of the week, as this is 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 2, as God has prospered him, there's no 10% binding here. There's no command to tithe, and a tithe is a 10%, 10% collection. Now look at 2 Corinthians 9, verse number 6 and 7. He says, verse number 7, Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. Well, if you're going to tell me that I have to do 10%, then that creates necessity. So what you have in the New Testament system for Christians, the Old Testament was written for Jews, Hebrews, which you're not and I'm not. But I am a Christian, and Paul wrote the First Corinthian letter to Christians. So I don't, I've read my New Testament, and I have not found where the Christians were commanded to tithe. I have not found where they were tithing, like giving us an example of tithing. But what I find is a 
free will offering on the first day of the week. Now, you maybe you say, well, Caleb, I guess I'm living under a rock because I don't know this about Creflo Dollar. Well, we're going to listen to this once. Then we're going to move on to what really is our topic tonight. This is just his discussion about changing. I, um, I want to start off by saying to you that I'm still growing and that the teachings that I've shared in times past on the subject of tithing were not correct. And today I stand in, in humility to correct some things that I've taught for years and believed for years, but could never under, understand it clearly because I had not yet been confronted with the gospel of grace, which has made the difference. Right away, like we asked this question, are there some things that you think your pastor could work on? Now, I recognize, let's say it a different way. You, you probably think everything your pastor says is fantastic. Let's say it this way. In your sect, do you hear your pastor teach about other sectarian groups? If you're Baptist, you're going to hear your pastor talk about Methodists, right? And everybody that's Baptist looks at these Methodists and they say, yeah, they need to change. And the Babs look at the Lutherans and say they need to change. And the Roman Papists look at almost everybody who calls himself a Protestant and say, y'all need to start submitting to the Pope. The Pope is, quote, they would call, I don't believe this, and the Bible doesn't teach it, but Roman Papists say that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. He's sitting in the place of Jesus the Christ, and y'all need to be getting with that. That's false doctrine. So we look around and we say, yeah, people need to do some changing on their teaching. But we rarely see people do it. Creflo Dollar is doing it. And... You know, some people might say, I still don't like him. Well, I can't do anything about that. I want, I want a policy. Fear, fear, time. I may lose some friends. The reason is through this. Go with me Go in with our me text today in the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. And we're going to begin this, oh, probably two or three or four weeks as we really dig into it now, you don't know it, the last two weeks I've been setting you up for the gospel of grace has brought you to, it's just that elephant in the room or the cloud together, ready, read. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace. That's not just a cute little verse of scripture, that's literally, you are not living and you are not conducting your life under the Mosaic law, which tithing is a part of the, of the law. Not wrong. I'm saying we covered some of this on Thursday night in Reedsville, North Carolina. If you're watching tonight and you're in Wilson, North Carolina, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, you're watching on WIG, what you need to do is take this piece of information, go back and ask your pastor. You say, I heard on what does the Bible say? That Creflo Dollar is changing his teaching on tithing because he says... Creflo Dollar said, quoting Romans 6.14, that tithing is an aspect of the law of Moses, and we're not under the law of Moses. And then ask your pastor, why are we tithing? Now, here's how he did this. You see how he, he's trying to explain to everybody why, why I changed, Creflo Dollar says. Well, basically, he tells everybody, look, I read Romans 6.14, and it told me I'm not under the law. And then he started basically recognizing the only way I can keep teaching tithing to these people is by going backwards to the law of Moses and pulling Malachi 3.8 out, which is a Hebrew text. That part of Malachi was a process that the Jews went through. They gave their tithes. But in Hebrew 7 verse number 5, I don't have that command because I'm not a Hebrew. I don't know any Levites. Look at this. Have you got your Bible out? Seriously, y'all, this is a big part of this broadcast is having your Bible out, and I would encourage you to have a notepad out too. Verily they that are the sons of Levi. That's a tribe of Israel, right? They that are the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. That is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. You're not a Jew. You did not come out of the loins of Abraham. You are not a member of the physical 12 tribes of Israel. You're not under the law. 
Therefore, tithing is not for you. But yet, sectarian preachers just beat people over the head with the tithing. And I have to say, it's because the membership is ignorant. And they want you to stay that way. I want you to flourish in your Bible study, which is why I'm asking you to have your Bible out tonight. I want you to really, really grow. So, this is how Creflo does it, real quick. He says, look at Romans 6, uh, 6 14. Tithing is an aspect under the law, and you're not under the law. He says, therefore, we can't teach tithing anymore. That's not incorrect. He pulled a book, a chapter, and a verse. He read it to the audience, and he basically reasoned through it. And that's what you and I need to be doing together. We need to reason together. We need to have conversation together. And you need to start talking to people inside of your particular sect. Let me illustrate this with you. Let's talk about it. You go up to your preacher. And you say, I heard Creflo Dollar say he's changing. And your preacher might say, I don't care a thing about Creflo Dollar. That's fine. You go up to your preacher and you say, Creflo Dollar's changing. Uh, he's not going to tithe anymore. And this is the verse that he used. Ask your preacher about it. Probably your preacher is going to dismiss you. He's going to wave it off. He might, I'm saying, y'all, just because somebody can give an answer doesn't mean it's correct. He might give you some type of nonsensical response. And in the moment you say, hmm, good enough for me. But then you go away and you think about it. And you say, he didn't answer what I said. So here's what you do. Start spreading this verse to the other members of your particular sect. Romans 6, 14. I would really encourage you to use Hebrews 7, 5 instead. Use Hebrews 7, 5, the people in the pew with you. Why are we tithing? Why do we tithe here? This isn't a Christian commandment. This is something that went to the Jews. Why are you a Jew? Do you know what tribe you're from? And they're all going to say, no, then why are we, you know any Levites? Why are we doing this? Get the conversation going around in your particular sect so that you can start making the change. We don't have the clip. It's available on YouTube. He tells the people, look at Matthew 5.17. Creflo Dollar says, look at Matthew 5.17. Think not that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And Creflo Dollar said, if Christ has fulfilled the law, how are you still keeping the law? Good point. Again. What you need to do is just show me in the New Testament a book, chapter, or verse where the apostles were commanding tithing to the Christians. Now, we did this. Can I make a point with Wilson, North Carolina, Rocky Mount, North Carolina? We had this broadcast uh, Thursday night. And so what you can do is go here to the YouTube channel, click the video section, and you can watch what we did. Even though you live in Wilson, Rocky Mount area, you can see what Reedsville got on their television station, Creflo Dollar. If tithing is out, so is the piano. Does your sect have a church band? Do you all use the piano? You say, well, we use an acoustic guitar, but we don't allow electric. That makes no sense. How'd y'all come up with that in the Bible? You don't have a scripture for the guitar in your electric or acoustic. Now, check it out that way. But if Creflo follows his same logic, tithing is out of the Old Testament, therefore we can't command it anymore. Psalm 150, verse number 3, that says, Praise with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the psaltery and the harp. That's Old Testament also. And you will not find a New Testament text that commands instrumental music in our worship today. But what you will find is explicit statements where the only thing that's said, the only thing that's commanded, is singing. Now, you go back, you watch that broadcast, check it out, talk to me somehow, text me, call me, email me, what have you, and we talk about it. Now, this is where I want us to be tonight, okay? I like the fact, I appreciate the fact that Creflo Dollar looked at that passage and he said, man, tithing is out of the law. I'm not under the law. We're supposed to be operating out of the New Testament. I can't keep teaching that. Some people think this is going to just be some gimmick that he works out to his advantage. Maybe we'll see, but let me say this to you. This is why Creflo Dollar has this one thing still left in his teaching and in his operation that's basically going to kill his whole new tithing idea. Here it is. Uh, it, was an uh, it was an expression of his dependence on God. The Lord woke me up at 5.30 this morning and he said this to me and he said, get up and write it down before you lose it. He said that your giving is a response to my ability to take care of you. He said, when you give, it is your declaration of dependence on me. Can I, can I read that again? Yeah. Your giving is a response to God's ability to take, take care of you. 
I give because I now know that God can take care of me. That's why Abraham gave. He gave a tip. Like, listen, it's like, Caleb, he's, he's just continuing the tithing idea. And you said that you're for that. You are for getting away from tithing because it was a command for Jews and we're not Hebrews. No, 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 no. You missed it. Listen to this again. Small statement. And you listen, the crowd is eating it up. <laughs> Hallelujah. You guys, seriously, listen to this. I, it was an expression of his dependence on God. The Lord woke me up at 530 this morning and he said this to me. And he said, get up and write it down before you lose it. Creflo Dollar is telling people, God woke me up at five in the morning to talk to me. This is why he's not going to make any headway. Creflo Dollar has just, man, y'all, he dropped a bomb on people when he, I'm talking about the sectarian pastors, John 10 calls them a hireling. All they do is they care about money, and all they do is they teach about money. Health and wealth, gospel, name it and claim it, all that business. Now, here's my thing. Creflo tells everybody, look, y'all, I've been incorrect on tithing. We're going to start making some corrections around here. And then he goes and he says, but God woke me up at 5 in the morning and said, write this down so you don't lose it. You know what people who disagree with Creflo are going to do? If Creflo Dollar can tell you, God spoke to me at 5 in the morning, yeah. Well, God spoke to me, Creflo, at 4 in the morning and told me that you were going to get a message from the devil at 5 a.m. You just thought it was God, but it was the devil talking to you. Anybody can do that. Anybody can just come up and say, God gave me a vision. God gave me a dream. God gave me X, Y, Z. Had a woman tell me, she said, God, she said, the Spirit. She said, the Holy Spirit picked me up out of my bed, lifted me in the air, carried me across the bedroom, and she said, the Holy Spirit made me transport through a wall. Whew! I said, what did that do for you? She said, it let me know that I, she said, it let me know that I am special to God. And I said, kind of like this idea of God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. That lets you know you're special to God. All this nonsense about you had a dream, you had a vision. Someone says, Caleb, you don't believe in dreams and visions? Let me tell you something. I'm a Christian. Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Yes, I believe in dreams and visions and signs that are documented and recorded in the Bible, but it says in verse number two, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. You are not getting, I'm not getting, Creflo Dollar's not getting dreams, visions, signs, diverse manners. Jesus spoke to us, as it says in Hebrews 1, 2. And what did Jesus say? He said in John 17, verse number 20 and 21, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Hebrews 1, 2 says that in that time frame, Jesus was speaking to the people. And in John 17, 20, when Jesus did talk to the people, he said, y'all need to be listening to the apostles. That's through their word. The apostles' doctrine. Baloney. God woke me up at five in the morning to tell y'all. Can you believe y'all? Of his dependence. Of his dependence. On God. On God. The Lord woke me up at 5.30 this morning and he said this to me and he said, get man, up right. Creflo, somebody should have pulled him aside and said, look, look, man, you're going to go out and go tell people God's talking to you and you're making changes on your doctrine. Why didn't God tell you 15 years ago that you were teaching incorrectly on tithes? Hello? Is anybody awake in this auditorium? He told you that God talked to him at 5 in the morning and said, write this down in case you forget it. And you, <laughs> you have one-on-one -on -one conversation with God and you're just now finding out that you've been incorrect for 15 years. You're just now hearing from God that you were uh, incorrect on tithing after we bought you a 65, what is it? How much does a jet cost? I don't even know. Millions of dollars on a jet. Well, I tell you, God wanted him to have that jet. You got a jet? You paid for his jet. You get to ride on his jet? You out of your mind. Listen to this, y'all. Sit it down before you lose it. The Lord woke me up at 5.30 this morning and he said this to me and he said, get up and write it down before you lose it. The Lord woke me up at 5.30 this morning and he said this to me and he said, get up and write it down before you lose it. Get up and write it down before you lose it. Kind of sounds like having a Bible, doesn't it? It's written down in case we lose it. People aren't reading it. 
you very well may be one of these people who's not reading. If you didn't know tithing is taught in your New Testament text, you haven't been reading. I don't doubt. You say, well, Caleb, I go to church every Sunday. You go to a man-made sect every Sunday, and you sit in a pew. You might take a nap every Sunday. And probably, if you're going to a man-made sect, y'all got 40 minutes of band. <laughs> That's all that is. You go to 40 minutes of bad band music. The preacher gets up. You know, let me do this with you real quick. You know, I write the bulletin. That's what this is. This is a church bulletin, and I use it for a page and a half Bible article. There's announcements on there. Look, if you got the bulletin, you got the announcements. But what your pastor does is your pastor gets up and reads the announcements to y'all as if you don't know how to read. And then he reads the prayer list to you. You know what he's doing? He's killing time. Do you know why? He doesn't have any Bible material ready for you. So we're going to read the announcements. We're going to read the prayer list. He's going to tell a joke, tell a story. He's going to read something out of the uh, book of Psalms. Put an amen to it. Bring the band back up. Can you believe he just said this? this morning and he said this to me and he said get up and write it down before you lose it what I want to do and yeah I'm saying that is baloney and you might be saying I don't like him saying that about Creflo Dollar I'm saying this about anybody who openly contradicts the Bible you say like Caleb you said a moment ago you're 28 years old he's obviously however many years your senior the Bible is older than Creflo Dollar and God deserves our respect. Someone says it's disrespectful to Creflo Dollar, and he's your elder. God deserves more respect than any elder walking the face of the earth. I don't know how we got this idea. I do. We aren't reading our Bibles. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, someone says, you're watching this broadcast, you say, this is wild. You know, because folk haven't had people talking to them the way I'm talking to the crowd, that's how we got in the shape that we're in. This business about, well, Creflo Dollar, that's his church and that's his pulpit, and you ought to respect that. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 6. These things, brethren, things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn not to think above men that which is written. No, I don't have respect for individuals who just throw the Bible aside and say absolute nonsense like God woke me up at 5 in the morning to tell me X, Y, Z. And so this evening, you and I are about to look at a load of scriptures to prove this point. God is not talking to you in your dreams. He is not giving you visions. He is not, and I'm talking about you're driving down the road and somebody just, you know, they said, I had a, a booming sound and thunder and lightning and then I heard the voice of God in my automobile. No, you did not. I don't believe that. It goes against scripture. And then someone would say, well, Caleb, how dare you have the audacity to say that to us? My own granddad, my dad's dad, he said stuff like that. He said that he was driving in his pickup truck and he told my dad, he said, the, the Holy Spirit just filled the cab of my pickup truck with just beautiful light. I think he may have said to pick the truck up, all kinds of stuff. But my dad's response to his own dad, my granddad, he said, Dad, you are living in adultery and have been for years. Why would the Holy Spirit be giving you these fantastic moments of filling the cab of your pickup truck with light when you don't even respect what the Bible says about marriage and divorce? Does that make sense? I know that you are saying, well, your dad's response to his dad makes sense. But the granddad saying that he, while living in adultery, is getting this miraculous vision and experience from the Holy Spirit, that doesn't make sense. And you're right to say that. But my point of that was, even our own family members, we have to correct them and contradict them because they are contradicting the text. Now, one more, if you don't mind, let's do this. One more video so that you can see this. Come back come back we can have more conversation so what I do is I want to go back to this moment of anybody can say this right Reflo Dollar said at five in the morning God woke him up and said write it down so you don't lose it and we say it kind of sounds like the Bible anybody can say this and a ton of people do say it weeks ago when is it June 12th on June 12th I did a broadcast where I was exposing Middlesex Holiness Pentecostal Church, Middlesex, North Carolina. 
I was exposing their whole false idea of what they call worship. That's not New Testament worship. They don't have the Holy Ghost over there. They're not speaking in tongues. It's totally against 1 Corinthians 14.40. 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, Let everything be done decently in order. Middlesex Pentecostal Holiness Church is out of order. And when I did that broadcast, I had some local Pentecostals call in, and this is what one of them said. Come back. Come back, we can have more conversation. So hopefully you can participate in that too. Oh, well, have a great night. Okay. Uh, I hope that the Lord really speaks to you and that he shows you he's more than what you've limited him to. How would he do it? Special revelation. So not the Bible. Uh, that's not what I said. Well, what is special revelation? So the Lord doesn't speak to you? Through the Bible, but no, I've never heard the audible voice of God. Oh my gosh, so you don't have that still, small voice that he speaks to you? So what does the still, the small voice? Why doesn't the, the still, doesn't you. why does the still, small voice not help you with this Bible conversation? Because you've not been able to do anything with the word immediately. Like, you, you guys just act like that's not there. Good part of it is because I've been interrupted most of the time. Okay, you're, you're fine. You're good to go. I won't interrupt you. Deal with immediately. Acts 3 and Luke 8, 44, immediate. That was a Pentecostal member. He's charismatic. He's holiness. Maybe he's apostolic. But he calls in and he says, I hope that God shows you the air of your way. And I say, how would he do that? And he said, special revelation. What is that? Dreams, vision, direct conversation with the Lord. And I said, well, God doesn't audibly speak to me. And he said, oh, you don't have the small, still voice? Do you know what that beeping was? Look at this. I won't interrupt you. Deal with, I won't interrupt you. Deal with immediately. Acts 3 uh, no. and Luke 8, 44, immediate. Instead of allowing the small, still voice to basically take him over and wear me out, he hung up the phone. Okay, I won't interrupt you. Tell me how you're healing people miraculously, and it's not immediate because that's how it worked in the New Testament text. When they healed somebody, it's immediate. There it is right there. What is that? That's Luke 8, 44. I said, I won't interrupt you. You got the floor. Uh, uh, uh. Small, still voice wasn't helping him out. But here's one more thing, y'all. What am I to do when somebody like Creflo Dollar, one moment he's quoting the Bible, the next minute, he's having personal conversations with deity at 5 in the morning. This young man calls into the broadcast and he says, I have a still small voice talking to me that gives me special revelation. From God. I have never heard the audible voice of God. I don't know. I don't know anybody that has. There may be somebody. I'm from God. I have never heard from God. I have never heard the audible voice of God. I'm from God. I have never heard the audible voice of God. I'm from God. I have never heard. What am I supposed to do? This man's name is Jackie Poe, and he is a ordained pastor for the Cleveland, Tennessee sect, Church of God. He is with the Cleveland, Tennessee Church of God. He obviously is the pastor of that group, and he himself says, I've never heard the audible voice of God. Of all the Pentecostals that Jackie Poe knows, he says, I've never known anybody who has heard the audible voice of God. Well, I thought y'all were con you know, just getting this small, still voice. Special revelation. See, that's where I come in and I'm just, you know, doing my best that I can and I'm trying to read my Bible. But when I start listening to people like Creflo Dollar, I get confused. And you're at home right now and you're saying, I'm, I'm confused. Now, you're saying, you're confused. And then someone says, see, Caleb, you're just confusing people. No, no, no. The sectarian preachers who don't use the Bible and you just sit there in the pew and this is what a lot of men do. Yeah. Yeah. And now, it's like you're just scrolling through your phone. You get your phone out, you're just scrolling through. You're not listening. You don't have a clue. And you're on the deacon board, man. You don't have a clue. You're looking at your phone. Now, let's do this.
you have a Bible somewhere in your house, somewhere in your house tucked away, it would take about five minutes and you might find it. You got a Bible somewhere. Get it out and let's look at this together. God speaks to us today only through the Bible. In your Bible, now can I say this to y'all? Can we just have a moment, even before we start looking in the Bible, we'll get there, we'll, we'll come back to it. But now this is what I want you to do. Get your Bible out. I've got it on the screen. This is a King James Bible program. If you want, we can double check here. That's asking a lot of me because it's like I build the slides and then someone says, well, I don't trust your slides. Look at what 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17 says. From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now let's go back to this because I've got it highlighted. Paul writing to Timothy, who is a Christian, and Timothy is being sent out by Paul to help Christians, basically who are out of order, like we said earlier. And he emphasizes to these people, you need to be paying attention to Scripture. From a child, Timothy knew the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What Scriptures did he have as a child? Well, you know that in Paul's time frame, the New Testament Scriptures are in the process of being written. Timothy, as a young man, he would have had the Old Testament Scriptures. Now, you say, well, Caleb, you were making the point a moment ago that we need to start distancing ourselves from the commands of the Old Testament. The worship of the Old Testament for the Hebrews, but look what Jesus said. John 5, 39. Chapter 5, verse 39. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. You can read your Old Testament text, and you will see the Old Testament text, number one, pointing to its own end, Jeremiah 31. But all these different prophecies and promises you will find, Jesus says, they were talking about Him. So yes, you can use your Old Testament text, Genesis chapter 12. That's the promise of Abraham that is fulfilled in Christ Jesus, Galatians chapter 3. This is the moment where you need to be writing this down because there are a lot of people who are not accustomed to having Bible study to this degree. Like I said, you get announcements, prayer list, 45 minutes of band, one psalm, and you put an amen on it. We're covering a lot of ground tonight. Now, let's look at this again. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, this again is an uncommon idea. When people are, quote, in church and something happens that they don't like, that's what they simply say. Well, I didn't like that. I didn't like how you said that. Or they say things like this. That's not what I grew up with. That ain't how my granddaddy did it. Nobody cares what your granddad did. Nobody cares what my granddad did. What is he saying? The scripture is how we correct folk. And someone says, well, who are you to correct? Look, I am not a perfect individual. Neither are you. Nobody is living totally sinlessly perfect. And yet, Paul, who knew that none of us were going to live to sinless perfection, he said, y'all are going to have to keep each other in check. You're going to have to reprove one another. You're going to have to correct each other. And the scriptures are what gives you the instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, you know, when you say, I did something thoroughly, you covered it. <sighs> Paul says the scriptures are going to take care of you. But what y'all are doing is y'all are ignoring the Bible. Then you come over here and say, well, I'd like to have a dream and a vision and a sign. You're not getting it. And you're just making it up. Now, look at... This one, this is 1 Timothy 4, 13, 16. Again, Paul, an apostle, writing to an evangelist, Timothy, who's helping him do the work. Paul tells Timothy, Till I come, give attend attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now, let's take a moment. And somebody says, I just, you know, I don't know about all this talk about doctrine. Yeah, I'm sure you don't if you attend a man-made sect like Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Pentecostal, Apostolic, what have you. You can't say that doctrine is not important unless you go ahead and cut First and Second Timothy out of your New Testament text. Some of the best Bible study you can do is with your King James Bible and a concordance. All this is is a dictionary. 
So what I would encourage you to do, folks who say, well, Caleb, I don't like this, I don't like this segment because doctrine is not important. Go to Goodwill, find yourself a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. If it's a hardback, it'll cost you $2, and if it's a paperback, it'll be a dollar. So you go in here and you find, <laughs> look at this, doctrine. Okay, here we go. You go in here and you find doctrine, and it's going to have all the verses that it's going to be used in. Acts 2.42, Acts 5.28, Acts 13.12, Acts 17.19, Romans 6.17, Romans 16.17, 1 Corinthians 14.16. Boom! Look at, there, I know you can't see it. There's a ton of usages of doctrine in Timothy, First and Second Timothy, and you're going to tell me doctrine doesn't matter? Get yourself a strong concordance. It'll help you out. It's not a church manual. That's what y'all are accustomed to. You say, give me a creed so I don't have to think. Tell me, word for word, what I got to believe so I don't have to think. That's not how the Bible works. Paul said, give attendance to reading. Pay attention to the doctrine. Romans 10, 17. You know, a lot of folk love Romans 10. And some people say, well, I love the whole New Testament. Well, if you're Southern Baptist, you only know John 3, 16 and Romans 10. I'm sorry, but that's all y'all know. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, everybody knows what the Word of God is. It's the, Bi it's the Bible. We all agree on that until I or some other New Testament Christian comes in the room and says, God is not giving y'all visions, dreams, and special revelation. You say, the, the, my special revelation is just as much as God's Word as that written text. Everybody agreed that this was God's Word until I specifically started saying, you're not getting special revelation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's it. Faith does not come by having the Westminster Confession, which is what Presbyterians use. Faith is not produced by reading the Common Book of Prayer, which is what the Episcopalians use. And if you basically Google, probably if you're Southern Baptist and you look at your own particular website, your Southern Baptist sect website, you'll probably find somewhere in there that they say, we subscribe to the Southern Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Y'all aren't following the Bible. You're following tradition, which is creeds written by men. Romans 10, 17, 1 Corinthians 4, 17. It's not just the written word, and this is coming back to what we said at the beginning. Someone says, this broadcast has been rough. You went after a Creflo Dollar, and then you just started going after all these different Pentecostals, Charismatics, and Apostolics because they claim special revelation. They are not getting special revelation. But now look at this. I want, because that's what Jesus wants, unity. We're going to go through this in a moment and show you that all this division that y'all have going on is sinful. God is not happy with it. If you're involved in it, He's not happy with you. Someone says, well, I don't know that you can speak in the place of God. I am actually very careful with what I say. I am qu quoting the Bible. Look, 1 Corinthians 4.17, Paul said, For this cause I have sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul could go anywhere. He was teaching the exact same thing. How is it today? You can't just go anywhere. If you go to Lynchburg, Virginia, you're going to be looking at Southern Baptist Hotbed, right? Lynchburg, Virginia is where Jerry Falwell Southern Baptist College is. So if you go in there, you're going to be looking at one of the biggest Southern Baptist groups in America. You go to Cleveland, Tennessee, Pentecostal Hotbed. You go up to, I, I can never remember where Geno Jennings is. Maybe he's in Philadelphia. You're going to get that. You go, and I don't, I don't know how like Lutherans ended up in Missouri, but they got a bunch of Lutherans over in Missouri. It ought to be 1 Corinthians 4, 17, everywhere you just have Christians all teaching the same thing. You know what? Let's go back to Creflo Dollar. How are we all, Caleb, how are we all going to teach the same thing? It was an expression of his dependence on God. The Lord woke me up at 5.30 this morning and he said this to me. And he said, get up and write it down uh, before you lose write it. Write it down before you lose it. Caleb, how are we going to all teach the same thing and worship the exact same way? Write it down before you lose it. If we were all following the Bible, we could do it.
like I said, I'm 28. I had a young guy, and he was an independent, fundamental Baptist. And he, he cared more about being a five-point Calvinist. And you say, Caleb, I don't know what you're talking about when you say an independent, fundamental Baptist and a five-point Calvinist. I know that you don't because those are not biblical terms. Nowhere in your New Testament will you find people saying, we're independent, fundamental Baptists. Nowhere in your New Testament will you find people saying, we're five-point Calvinists. What you will find in your New Testament is what I have been saying, that they were Christians. They were children of God. They were disciples. But you will not find this idea of dividing up into sectarian groups. The way that we're going to have unity is we're all going to start following the Bible. Oh, yeah, and the reason I brought up that young guy, he's a little bit older than me. And he said, Caleb, it's like a, he said, it's a nice idea that you have about bringing all these people together. He said, never going to happen. With people like him, it will never happen because he values his tradition more than anything else. And sometimes people get so ate up with disliking folk that they basically say, well, if Ted's doing it, I don't want to get within a mile of it. Listen, if Ted's going to heaven, you better wish you're within a mile of Ted. If Ted's following the New Testament text, then you need to be with Ted and you need to get over whatever problem you got with him. That's ridiculous. Can I go back to the informer? That's what we're trying to get away from. My enemies and me. My point of the informer this morning, email me at calebgrobertson at gmail.com. We'll get you on the informer list. Look, if I disagree with you, I don't hate you. <laughs> Some people hating on me, digging into me. Man, you ought to be trying to convert me. You know what I'm saying? Change my mind if you think you got the truth. It hardly ever happens. Now, someone says, Caleb, go back to that other call. What'd he say? What'd the young man say? Come back. Come back. We can have more conversation. So hopefully you can participate in that too. Well, have a great night. Okay. Uh, I hope that the Lord really speaks to you and that he shows you he's more than what you've limited him to. How would he do it? Special revelation. So not the Bible? Uh, that's not what I said. Well, what is special revelation? So the Lord doesn't speak to you? Through the Bible, but no, I've never heard the audible voice of God. Oh my gosh, so you don't have that still small voice that he speaks to you? So what does the still the small voice why doesn't the still guide you? Why does the still small voice not help you with this Bible conversation? Because you've not been able to do anything with the word immediately. Like you you guys just act like that's not there. Good part of it is because I've been interrupted most of the time. Okay, you're you're fine. You're good to go. I won't interrupt you. Deal with immediately. Acts three gotcha. and Luke eight forty four, immediate. Now, let me just take a second. You and I, you say, Caleb, all you did was come on here and talk trash about all these other people. No, no, no. You and I have covered a lot of ground tonight. I gave you Hebrews 7, verse number 5. You could take this to any preacher, any pastor. That They're not. 1 Timothy 3. Look, your pastor doesn't meet the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3. But you could take this to any of your beloved teachers and ask them, Hebrews 7, 5, why are we tithing in here? Verily they that are the sons of Levi, that's not your preacher, he's not of, of a Levite tribe, who received the office of the priesthood. He's not a priest, is he? No, y'all call him pastor, one man pastor. Have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. Are you a Hebrew living under the law of Moses or are you supposed to be living under the New Testament? That is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham, and you're not a Hebrew. Look, I gave that to y'all for free. You can take that. We're covering a lot of ground. I gave you all those passages up until now that promote reading the Scripture. Y'all read creed books, and you read periodicals. Uh, like I've said this before, somebody said, my, they said, my mother died and left me all her Billy Graham books, so I'm gonna, I got a lot of Bible study ahead of me. Reading a Billy Graham book is not Bible study. Reading Joyce Meyer is not Bible study. <laughs> reading your Bible is Bible study, and I'm saying reading it in context learning to link the New Testament epistles back to the book of Acts. And we'll talk about that. If you keep watching What Does the Bible Say, then we'll talk about that and how to use Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in relation to the rest of the New Testament text. But let's do this real quick. I'm giving you another one. Someone says, Caleb, what about that small, still voice? You know, that is in your Bible. That's 1 Kings 19.12. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Come on. 
you, you started like flipping over in your Bible to get to 1 Kings. Do you even know what's going on over there? Are you sure that you want to start trying to pull that out and say, hey, hey, that's me? That's not you. It has nothing to do with you. And this I'm about to show you is like not any semblance to what's going on in today's sectarian community. Number one, this is the prophet Elijah. Elijah had just spent years in hiding, let's say about three years in hiding for his life from Ahab and Jezebel. Nobody's looking to persecute you in a man-made sect. You say, Caleb, you're persecuting people. I'm talking to you as your neighbor. I'm talking to you. Nobody's looking to persecute you. You know why? Because nothing that you teach in the Baptist sect, in the Methodist sect, in the Lutheran sect, nothing that y'all teach bothers anybody. Y'all got this easy believism going on. You got almost everybody on planet Earth going to heaven when 1 John chapter 5, 18 and 19 says the whole world lieth in wickedness. And look, I'm... I'm for getting people to go to heaven. That's why we evangelize. Anybody enough to get into their text, especially if you're a five-point Calvinist, you're out here telling people nothing you do could possibly help your salvation situation. God just randomly picks you or he doesn't. All right. Not in my hands. He's not like you. He was out here sticking up for the righteous folk, trying to do what their scripture said, even to the point of death. Here's another one. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah had just done battle. He had a public debate with 450 false prophets of Baal. And when he won the debate and the false prophets of Baal lost, they executed them. Now, I'm not talking about executing anybody, but here's another thing. Y'all won't ever debate. Your pastors get in the pulpit and they, they just shout and they do X, Y, Z and they talk about their degrees. They went to seminary. They're not going to debate. How does a person become a Christian? How does a person become a saved child of God? It is not by belief alone. It's not by faith alone. You are going to have to obey the gospel and that is going to involve water baptism and there's not a Baptist preacher in your area that can gainsay what I'm teaching. Acts 2.38, Mark 16.16. 16. I can talk, and I've already debated a Baptist PhD, and so has my dad. That's not the issue. They are afraid to come out and have these conversations, and so you say, well, those are Baptists. Look, I can't get a Methodist to come out from underneath their rock, or the Presbyterians, or the Lutherans. Pentecostals? They are quickly put on the run. When they don't know any better, they come out, but they are very quickly put on the run. You guys are not living up to 1 Kings 19 at all in any sense. Now look at this. 1 Kings 19, 12, this is not you. The small, still voice. After being in hiding, after having the debate, Elijah goes over into a cave and he just says in 1 Kings 19, I wish I was dead. Why? Because he's been working so hard and he feels all alone and he says, I just wish I was dead. And the small, still voice is God calling out to Elijah to say, more left to be done. And Elijah says, I just want to die though. You're not a prophet. <laughs> and one thing that has, Elijah has going for himself, when he prophesied things, they came true. Y'all don't have any successful prophecies. None. Zero. And you know, you might end up saying, well, you know, my wife was pregnant and my pastor prophesied what the gender was going to be. Great! He had a 50 chance of being, 50% chance of being right. Fantastic. Talk about a prophecy. That's not it. You can't use 1 Kings 19, 12. You're not a prophet. This context has nothing to do with you and neither do the sectarian preachers even relatively come close to this. Now, you're not anywhere near that. Can I ask this question? We got nine minutes left. We're going to move. If God is speaking to random individuals, why don't we just cut out the Bible? And I'm saying, get real with this idea that God is speaking to you personally and throw your Bible away. Well, that's my family Bible, and we got the family tree written in it. There you go. I told you, you care about your tradition more than you do the written text. The only reason you want to throw your Bible is because the family tree is in. Acts 8, 26 and 27. Write it down. Read it on your own time. Creflo says, God talked to me at 5 in the morning. Young man from Middlesex uh, Pentecostal Holiness Church, he says he's got the small, still voice going on. <sighs> Acts 8, Philip goes to teach the Ethiopian eunuch. I'm asking you this question. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, un Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia. 
why didn't Philip just take Creflo Dollar's playbook and say, look, don't make me travel all the way down there. Just have God talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. That's what God does with Creflo Dollar one-on-one. -on -one. That's Acts 8. It takes a man. Romans 10, 14. You say, well, Caleb, I don't want to throw my whole Bible away. Well, cut out Romans 10, 14 because y'all don't believe it. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Well, Creflo Dog said, what you need a preacher for? God talks to me at 5 in the morning. Middlesex, Pentecostal Holiness said, what you need a preacher for? Everybody's got a small, still voice. That young man sounded really shocked and perplexed. Caleb, you don't have a small, still voice, no? And you know what? Maybe the small, still voice just kind of sounds like me when I read. Someone says, Caleb, you are being ridiculous. No, y'all are being ridiculous. This is out of your Bible. This came out of your Bible, the one you got at home. You dug it out somewhere. You finally found it. Romans 10, 14. How shall they hear without a preacher? Acts 10, 32 and 33. When God wanted Cornelius and the household of Cornelius to hear the truth, what did they do? Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, which is Peter, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Now you got Peter on one side and Cornelius on one side, and they're actually in this New Testament time frame, first century, being told to find one another. Why don't we just do like Creflo Dollar says and have God speak to Cornelius at five in the morning one-on-one? -on -one? Because it takes a preacher. You know, you go back and you look at Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading the book of Isaiah. People have to make an effort. You have to study. Teachers assist the people with the New Testament text, not tradition. Here's 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12. We're just going to show this. Do you know this is in your Bible? Y'all are out here saying that you got miracles, that you got special revelation, and I'm saying you don't have special revelation, but we do have the complete Finished Re revelation. I can't believe that I had to talk to church folk and really convince them that the Bible matters and is important, but I do. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, and that word is not sinless perfection, that word is complete. When the complete is come, that which is in part shall be done away. And a lot of folk are going to look at that and say, no, 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 we're never going to know things clearly until Jesus returns and then they go X, Y, Z. If you're telling me that Jesus is the perfect, what is the imperfect? Here it says, these gifts will go away. Well, why did they have those gifts in the first place? They only had those gifts. Mark 16, verse number 20. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. In the first century, they didn't have a finished New Testament. We do. So if they couldn't pull out book, chapter, and verse like I can, like you should, they had signs confirming their word. When that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. When, as I, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. Look, this is obviously an information text. The finished revelation gives us the information that we need. For what? Unity. How to please God. How to worship God. How to get along with each other. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12. Put that together with Ephesians 4, 12 through 15. The context is the removal of miraculous gifts for the complete revelation of God. Now, this is my closing thought. We covered a lot of ground tonight, and I'm sweating. If you start reading your Bible like I'm challenging you to, when you read the book of Acts and you read the three-year ministry of Jesus, this is what you're going to find. Only one church in the New Testament text, unity, by having only one church. Someone says, my, my church, your church. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make my final points. Okay, I've got three minutes. You're on what does the Bible say? Hi, Caleb. This is Gwendolyn Thomas from California. I finally caught your show live. I just want to say I've been listening to you and Johnny for seven years. Hey, I appreciate I support, the encouragement. I, I, I support your program, and I just want to say hello 
You guys are doing a fantastic job, and I'm from California. I ain't going to hold you long. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you. Have a good night. God bless you. I'm praying for you. Thank All you. Right. God bless you. Now, California watching as we're doing television in North Carolina. Look, if you read your Bible, you will find one church, and this is what I was going to say. People who say, my church, your church, their church. There is only one church, and around the Lord's church, there's a handful of sects that men made. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. That is a singular entity. You don't have Jesus say, I will build my churches. He doesn't say, I will build my denominations. He doesn't say, I will build different sectarian groups who fight with each other. No, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what that means, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Somebody says, well, Jesus did build his church in the first century, but we lost it. It disappeared, and now we've got the man-made sex. Again, that's nonsense. Jesus, how, how could you say that? You just said that Jesus failed in what he said. His church will not fail, which means it lasted from the first century until now, and people can identify it by reading their text. The churches of Christ salute you, Romans 16, 16. I am a member of the church of Christ. I'm a member, same thing. I'm a member of the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, verse number 12. In Matthew 12, 25, this is in your Bible. A lot of y'all don't believe it. Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. God's kingdom is here. It may be is not what you guys thought it was going to be, but if you look at Luke chapter 17, he says it's a spiritual kingdom. John 18, he says, My kingdom is not of this world. Colossians 1.13 says you're translating the kingdom. But Jesus said, a kingdom divided will be brought to desolation. And somehow y'all say, oh, the diversity, it's, it's beautifying the, the kingdom. No. It's hurting what the kingdom ought to be accomplishing on earth. He told you, you can't be divided. He said, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my children would fight. You are contrary. You're going against God's wishes when you say, well, division in religion is okay. No, it's sinful. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Now this I say that everyone who says, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Y'all are saying, I'm Baptist, I'm Methodist, I'm Presbyterian. And I'm over here saying, I'm Caleb. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the body of Christ. And now I'm out of time. 276-806-3641. Email address is calebgrobertson at gmail.com. Let your friends know about what does the Bible say on YouTube. We love y'all. We want everybody to be together in the body of Christ. We want unity in the religious community. You keep asking, what does the Bible say? God bless you. Good night.